Good evening. My name is Lisa Cawthorn. I'll be your host this evening for Focusing on You, a live webcast, which is sponsored by Hope Abounds. It will be live this evening, and then it will be uh, recorded so that you can watch it next Tuesday on either the Hope Abounds website, www.hopeabounds.org, the Hope Abounds app, Facebook, or you can also view it on the Roku app. I am a patient advocate that works with Hope Abounds. I'm also a breast cancer survivor and an oncology nurse. This evening, we're really pleased to have someone here who has a wealth of knowledge and has worked with cancer patients before. Her name is Frances Murkison. She's a life coach, an author, a speaker, a yogi, and the founder of MindfullyFed.org. So we're very excited to have her here this evening. So thank you, Frances, for being here. It's a pleasure. And I know you spoke, also spoke at a Hope Abounds workshop called Woman in the Mirror um, in February. Um, you've written a couple of books. I have. And what are the book's names? So one book is called Breathe, See, Nourish, Energize, A Pathway to Healing. And it lays out those four practices as a means to uncover the healing that's already taking place in us, in mind, body, spirit. And it is based on the Christian faith. <clears throat> and we go through each of those practices, this idea that the breath is our anchoring uh, practice. It is the breath of God that breathes through us. And it is something that is always with us, no matter where we go. Mm -hmm. And it's such a lovely vehicle to bring us back to the present moment, which is the only thing we have. And then this idea of seeing who we are in and through the eyes of God, as opposed to through the veil of our skin encapsulated ego. Oftentimes we're looking at ourselves with this vision that I'm not good enough, I'm not uh, smart enough, I don't do enough, I don't have enough, I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. And in the eyes of this beloved uh, spirit, this energy, this uh, what I call, who I call God, um, we are more than enough and that there is more than enough in the universe for us so that if we can get away from this sense of deprivation and live into abundance, which is what we were born with as original blessings. So for me, those two things help me to get to a place where I'm willing to nourish myself in mm -hmm. mind, body, spirit. And as a health coach, a certified health coach, what I do is I start with food. Because for me, food affects the way we think and the way we feel. So when I am eating clean food, whole food, fresh food, it actually changes the way I think and my perception of life. And so when I'm willing to breathe in the moment and see myself as beloved and eat the way my body, which might be different than the way you need to eat, mm -hmm. as fuel then my body is automatically going to heal. The body is a healing mechanism. It's always fixing a boo-boo, healing a joint issue, so that if I can power it with nourishing fuel, the body inherently knows what to do. And then this last uh, practice, which is energize, is really living into and out of uh, a vocation. And when I say that word, I'm not talking about uh, this grandiose uh, saving the world uh, job like Mother Teresa or being president of the United States. It's simply living authentically, living with a sense of joy, living with a sense of gratitude and being the most authentic Francis that I can be like you would be the most authentically so you mm -hmm. can be. So those practices, I actually stumbled upon them many years ago and now offer them as uh, a means for every person in my practice uh, to lead a life of wholeness and healing. So that's one book. And then the other book is Heal Your Whole Body, and that drills down very specifically around liver health. Mm -hmm. 
uh, particularly because the liver is such an amazing organ, organ in our body. It is quintessential for the detoxification of the body. And so I use uh, a science-based approach to uh, cleansing and healing the liver. And it, and it um, cul culminates in a cleanse that I offer four times a year. Uh, that's a 12-day cleanse that um, its whole purpose is to flush the liver of toxins so that the liver can actually flush the body of toxins, mm -hmm. which is so critical when we're talking about cancer and cancer survival. Wow. So at the workshop, Woman in the Mirror, that that's the four principles you sort of talked about I then. Did. I did. And you said you stumbled upon this I sort did. of philosophy or lifestyle or now how did that come about then for you? So for me, my story is, is that I am uh, 29 years clean and sober. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I, I am a card carrying uh, member of recovery and I'm really, really proud of that. My be. addiction started uh, in high school with an eating disorder. And I actually had a spiritual healing from that. But I never did the work of recovery. So mm -hmm. when I went to college, I went to Chapel Hill, I picked up alcohol and it was off to the races. When I got sober in uh, 1988, those four principles became uh, clear to me as a way for me to move forward in sobriety. So for 29 years, it's been part of my faith tradition. It's been part of my spiritual practice. Uh, I meditate daily. Uh, I really practice a, a, a daily mindfulness and um, certainly use it in my yoga practice and health coaching as well. So for people that may not know much about meditation or mindfulness, can you describe that a little more? Because I think some people think, oh, I, I don't, that's sort of new agey. I don't know what yeah. that is. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. could you describe that for our audience? For sure. So for me, mindfulness is moment to moment awareness mm -hmm. without judgment. So all that means for me is staying present in this moment, noticing that my mind is going to be like, what, what's happening tonight? What happened yesterday? Mm -hmm. What happened last month? What's going to happen next week? And because we're so driven around our agenda, it's so easy to be planning months ahead mm -hmm. or to be remorseful or regretful on what happened yesterday or six months ago. Mindfulness is trying to practice, and I say practice because we never get it right, because the mind's job is to think. The mind's job is to plan, program, organize, make things happen, discover, create. Busy. Busy. <laughs> the mind is busy. Mm -hmm. It is just a busy thing, and that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. What mindfulness does is it is a practice in drawing the mind back to the present moment and being awake enough to notice what's happening in this present moment. I'm right here with you, you're right here with me, and we're engaging one-on-one. -on -one. What a beautiful thing. So how can I stay present in the moment? That's where meditation comes in because it is literally a practice. It is setting five minutes, two minutes to simply sit, I just notice my breath. Mm -hmm. Notice how the temperature feels on my skin. Notice the sunlight on my head. Notice the ocean, since we live right here, so beautiful, right? Feels on my feet or my legs as I'm sitting. How does the cushion feel underneath my sits bones? It's just simply noticing and noticing when the mind travels. Oh, I'm doing laundry now. I'm planning yesterday's meal that I didn't get exactly right. What would I do differently? And saying, oh, mind is wandering. We come back to the present moment. It's just that simple. It's not easy, but it's a very simple practice. And for me, it is so grounded in every faith tradition. Meditation goes back thousands and thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of years. In the Christian tradition, the Desert Fathers chewed on the word. They, they acted out on the word. They sang the word. They meditated on the word. They chanted the word. 
this this idea of coming to the present moment for me is throughout our own scripture. Wow. And part of that focusing on sort of what's happening to you and maybe trying to tamp down the whole outside world gives you an opportunity to maybe relax more and clear your mind so that you're breathing maybe better too. Oh, without is a doubt. Absolu absolutely. Science now is confirming what the Eastern sages have known for a very long mm -hmm. time, right? As a nurse, you probably already know this, that the blood pressure drops, mm -hmm. the heart rate drops, like physiologically things totally settle down in the body. And the Buddhists have, have always said that when the mind calms, the clarity arises. Mm -hmm. And you, we think of the stirred water in a lake. You know, that's the mind churning, churning, churning. How is it that we can actually see more clearly if we don't give it a pause? The body is desperate for pause, is desperate for pause. And we start with two minutes, set a timer. We can do a walking meditation. That's a beautiful thing yes. to do. Especially in this area. Totally. In mm -hmm. the park, at the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the breathe part. Talk about that a little more. You, that's sort of the first part in your four steps. Correct? So it is. Talk about that and tell us more about it. Well, in every faith tradition, breath is synonymous with spirit. Mm -hmm. it, it is. Prana is spirit in Sanskrit, which is the most ancient language on the planet. It uh, goes back 5,000 years. In our own tradition, ruach or pneuma, they're both Hebrew and Greek words for breath, and they are always synonymous with spirit. So for me, the breath is our connection to whatever it is that we call divine. Mm -hmm. For me, the miracle of being alive is so divinely inspired. The whole word inspire, spire is breath, mm -hmm. is spirit. You know, so the fact that something breathed into us to make us come alive is enough gratitude for me for one day. So to just notice that whether I'm aware of it or not, I'm breathing. Mm -hmm. So then it allows me to realize, oh, my heart's beating. Oh, my blood is pumping. Oh, my feet are walking. Oh, I'm able to hear. I can see. Mm -hmm. The littlest things about the present moment enable me to have gratitude. And for me, gratitude is the balm for all ills. And it is the thing that I believe heals the body. Wonderful. So when you spoke to our survivors in February, what sorts of things were on their minds? Did they ask you about? How did they talk about maybe incorporating what you do? Did they mention anything about that? One of the questions that came up then was that two things, I think, and it comes up often. Mm -hmm among groups is that they love the idea of quote-unquote healthy eating, whatever that looks like in everyone's minds. Your version is going to be different than mine. Mine's going to be different than yours. But the idea that it's hugely expensive and it's very time-consuming. Oh. And that was, a, that was a concern that was raised. Mm -hmm. And my feeling about the expense is that whatever is coming in a box or a package, you're basically paying for the packaging and you're paying for the advertising behind that packaging. Broccoli growers don't pay for advertising and they don't pay for packaging. So for me, pound for pound, penny for penny, nutrient for nutrient, I'll take anyone to task around how expensive healthy eating is. Beans, I can buy a package of beans for 99 cents or $1.99, and it can last me four meals. And if I want a complete protein on top of that, brown rice or quinoa, 
a package of quinoa or a package of rice could last me a week. Mm -hmm. It's a dollar fifty, or I, right. I, I don't know what it is, but things in boxes that we buy at convenience stores or even at the grocery store, it's very expensive. Cereal is, you know, three and four dollars a box, and there's relatively minimal nutrients in a box of cereal for me. I would so much rather buy a canister of oatmeal, and a canister of oatmeal, pound for pound, nutrient for nutrient, penny for penny, is significantly cheaper than Kellogg's Frosted Flakes. So that's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, because a lot of people think granola, for instance, is very healthy, but if you read the ingredients, there's a lot of added sugar. So if somebody was going to make oatmeal on their own, you can get a big box. Huge. Like, give us a, a quick example of how you can cook oatmeal and maybe make it palatable and healthy oh. and all of that, because just oatmeal by itself, not so much. Right. Oh, I have lots of ways to cook oatmeal. So... Let's just take rolled oats, okay? So we're not going to go to like steel cut, just okay. regular rolled oats. So for me, there are two ways, maybe three, that I prepare it. One is that I cook it over the stove and I add nothing but a little cinnamon, a little stevia, which is a natural sugar substitute, right. and I use the drops because they're less processed than the powder, but the powder is, it's all relative. If you're using Splenda, let's use Stevia powder. Okay. Yeah. And if I want a little crunch in it, I take it off the stove once it's at the consistency that I like, <clears throat> and I will add almonds, pecans, uh, and I'll either crush them up or I can put them in whole, walnuts. If I want a little sweet, I'll add just a few raisins or a few cut up figs, which have a tremendous amount of potassium and magnesium. I try to minimize my dried fruit to nut mixture, as in making my own trail mix. I try to use two to one nuts to dried fruit mm -hmm. to keep the sugar down. For me, sugar, uh, particularly for those uh, experiencing some kind of disease or illness, cancer, sugar on that is like gasoline to a fire. Mm. We want to keep the sugar quotient of our diet as minimal as possible. So that's one way. Another way I love is to simply boil hot water and pour it over my oats so that I've got more texture there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll do the same thing. Cinnamon, nuts, a few little dried fruit, little stevia, yeah. And the other one is, is to do it overnight and just eat it cold. I love cold oatmeal in the summer. I think it's delicious. I'll add chia seeds, flax seeds, uh, maybe a little hemp seeds to beef up the protein and fat quality of the oatmeal. I'll also end up pouring a little uh, coconut oil on mm -hmm. top and or a little natural almond butter is lovely on top of oatmeal as well. See, I think it's great you can provide those helpful hints because if somebody says, oh, I don't know what to do with oatmeal because a lot of times you remember that from your childhood and it was, you know, it was okay. But that sounds delicious. So tell us more about clean foods because you mentioned clean foods. So what does that mean? So for me, clean food is as close to the way it looked when it was growing mm -hmm. as it does on the plate. So okay. I usually say, or I would like to say clean and whole. Okay. Okay. So whole food, whole nutrient, whole body. The body understands broccoli. The body understands peas, apples, carrots, cauliflower doesn't so much understand Fritos corn chips. <laughs> because when you read the label, right. right, their ingredients, Fritos are actually some of the cleaner ones, but when you start to read labels on the back of packages, boxes, mm -hmm. cans, we begin to read words that we don't understand. That is true. Loaf of bread, you think it's pretty simple flour and water? 
Well, maybe it is. If you make from it at the home, baker, it probably or if you is. Make mm-hmm. it from home. Mm-hmm. In the package, in the plastic, we start reading words that we don't understand. And I say to my first graders, if you don't understand it, the body's not going to understand it as well mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. The body has been eating plants and berries and nuts as long as we've been hunters and gatherers, which is millennia. Mm-hmm. It is just literally the last 200 years on the planet versus all this history where we are eating chemicals and preservatives right. and additives. So the more I can get back to carrots and broccoli and peas and beans and rice and less gobbledygook, right. the more whole and clean. And for me... It's not so much this moral issue that I'm eating clean food. It's all about what is my body going to interpret as fuel. Mm -hmm. If Mm -hmm. I'm looking for my body to heal a boo-boo, to recover from any kind of dis-ease, everything that I put in it, I want it to count. Right. And the more (laughs) my food counts the less quantity I'm going to need. Uh, A beautiful uh, nutritionist, uh, Anne-Marie Colbin, uh, once said that we are overfed and undernourished. Oh, that's a a very nice quote. As a culture. Right. And I really believe that. Go to these, try not to go buffet all you can eat and it's just mounds and mounds of food that has so little nutrient value so little high quality fat right that the body just needs more and more and more in order to feel satiated when it's ballooned but there's no quantity there's no quality there right right so that's a long-winded way of saying whole and clean and i think it's challenging because Terrible food is cheap. So that's the th- that's the myth. That well, I mean, if people are going out, oh right, yes, so out to you know fast food restaurants, it's easy to get something for five dollars. But actually, you're right. If they went home and they had beans and rice, or you know, some sort of salad with a, a grilled chicken breast on it, there's a lot you can do for five dollars at home. Right. You know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can make a package of chicken last pretty long. Right. A can of tuna fish you can put on top of greens, make it a salad, call it a day. Right. Right. So in your practice as a wellness coach, what sorts of things do you work with people on? I mean, you've mentioned these categories, but... How do you go about that? Do you find out what their goals are or do you sort of come to a compromise or how does that all pan out when you're working with them as a wellness coach? So clients find me and come to me with a plethora of issues. Okay. From high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, to weight issues, either under or over. Okay. Uh, A number of clients with eating disorders, and the universe just mirrors that for me. Uh, To uh, stress and anxiety is a big one. And I meet with them first time, and in that consultation, they will say to me, this is my presenting health concern. And oftentimes in that first meeting, the health concern that they present is not ultimately the one that is really at the root of Mm. a lot of their dis-ease. But we Mm -hmm. start there. And I generally start with food because for me, when we begin to eat more clean and whole, the mind does clear, it gets clearer. And then oftentimes the life coaching work gets really crystallized once someone begins to eat more cleanly. And what, what's interesting in that process is because they are practicing 
mindfulness in the way that they're eating. I was about to it say. It begins to shift <laughs> right. their whole life. Right. Food and planning what we're going to eat across the day. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, I get a lot of pushback. I don't want to think about food that much. Most of us think about food all the time. Oftentimes, it's afterwards when there's a lot of remorse. Uh. Or it's when we cannot go another minute without eating something. And that's Mm. when the blood sugar has gone too low and we're willing to just grab anything in the refrigerator. And we are constantly doing that because productivity is our holy grail. Mm -hmm. And we forego meals, we skip meals, and then we just completely eat a whole day's Mm -hmm. worth of food at the end of the day, which is in many ways just the opposite of how the body Do you ever is have people happy. come to you and say, just give me a plan on what to eat and I'll follow that? Because I've heard that from some people oh, before. without a doubt. I do not do that <laughs> because I want the client to own their wellness. Ah. And if they're just following my script, they're never going to figure out from their se- for themselves, it's 12 o'clock, I had this for breakfast, I slept this way for overnight. I have this much on my plate. I have this much family stress. What is it that I need to eat right now? Mm. And I, I want them to start owning that for themselves. And do you have them keep a food diary? Because I've heard that's very helpful. Hugely helpful. And I'm not so much interested in calorie counting. In fact, I'm not interested in calorie counting at all. I'm interested in knowing how did you feel before you ate? What did you eat? Uh How did you feel afterwards? So that we can begin to connect the dots Mm -hmm. on I slept this way, I worked out this way, I have this much stress, this deadline, I had this for breakfast, this for lunch, this for dinner, and how did I feel the very next day? Mm. Because how I feel now is often dependent on what happened prior to this moment. Well, and I think um, the number one sort of side effect that people talk about now with chemotherapy, for instance, is fatigue. Yeah. It used to be nausea and vomiting, but we have excellent medicine, not that it totally eradicates that, but fatigue is sort of the number one side effect. And sometimes that fatigue from cancer treatment can last up to a year. And they, people may not even realize they have fatigue until they can sort of look back and go, oh, man. So it sounds like this clean, healthful eating is also a way to get in touch with giving your body the energy it needs. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I was going to say earlier that one of the uh, biggest complaints I have with people coming for health coaching is uh, fatigue. Mm. Yeah. Uh, And often it shows up as fibromyalgia or, but I think for most of us, it's because the stress is here we get this much sleep and we eat really poorly. Mm. We may eat a lot, but we don't eat well for the body. Right. And I, I'm just a firm believer that the quality of our food and how we eat, mm-hmm. that we eat mindfully, we're willing to bless the food, we pause before we eat the food, we celebrate our food, we commune over the food, mm-hmm. we notice the food, we notice the textures, the colors, we notice how the food tastes while we're chewing. Proper chewing is so critical. Mm -hmm. All of that is so healing for the body. And when we're going to fast food, when we're eating in the car, when we're eating at our desk, we are literally unconscious while we're eating Mm -hmm. and the body doesn't register that we've Mm -hmm. had a meal. So then we're just grabbing something else and grabbing something else. And then you add caffeine on top of it. And it's like we're riding that sugar caffeine roller coaster all day long. Probably a lot of us that are guilty of that. Without a doubt. And I have tremendous compassion because productivity is king. We've got, if if it's not ourselves, we've Mm -hmm. got employers and board of directors and shareholders and family, family, Mm -hmm. all wanting us to get more done, get more done. Mm -hmm. So then you start out and you're talking about food with the folks that you work with. 
And then where do you go from there? So for some people who are struggling with weight issues or eating mm -hmm. disorders, we'll often stay with the food long enough for them to see their patterns. Mm -hmm. And then we try to go underneath that. What is triggering that need to fill this void up, mm. which is often not physical, oh, but emotional, wow. right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that I was hungry. It w was that I was feeling sad because my boss yelled at me because I don't feel like I'm really up to this job and I feel like a fraud and I'm pretending and, oh my God, did he find or, or did she find out that I don't really know what I'm doing and I feel so lonely tonight. There's no one in my house. And so I'm going to basically eat my friend. Like have ice cream, ice cream, the breakup and the ice cream. Totally. Stereotype. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. So then how do you have people, is it understanding the patterns that they're going for the bad food? Like how, is it the emotions that are associated with that? Is that what you're trying to get them to understand? That's a start. Okay. And people who really want to do the work can detect those and that comes out in the food journal mm -hmm. what were you feeling before you ate uh, what were you feeling while you ate mm -hmm. what were you feeling afterwards but the work doesn't stop there because really where the work goes and this is where mindfulness and meditation come in is that most of us beat ourselves up for having those feelings in the first place oh. and that's what we tend to use whatever our drug of choice is, whether it's food, exercise, work, mm -hmm. no food, uh, no exercise, um, that's where we tend to want to grab something to help us not feel that sense of failure, unworthiness, self-loathing mm -hmm. as a result of that original feeling. So that... Um, in Buddhism, they call it the second arrow. So the first arrow is the feeling, right? We got yelled at, so we, it hurt our feelings. It made us feel unworthy. But where we go after that is, I'm unworthy. Oh. As opposed to, I made a mistake. Right. I made a mistake. Can I have compassion on myself? So the practice then comes back to breathe, see, nourish, energize, mm -hmm. and just being willing to sit with the feelings. Got yelled at. affected my sense of self-worth. Maybe it triggers a feeling that I felt as a third grader when somebody yelled at me on the playground. And can I, can I have compassion on myself? Can I, can, I, can I extend that acceptance to myself mm -hmm. in that moment? And if I can practice, because I'm never going to get it, if I can com practice that compassion and that self-acceptance, I'm going to need the food less. Mm. And then I can pause long enough to listen. What do I need right now? Mm -hmm. Do I need a hot bath? Do I need to just go to bed? Do I need to go walk at the beach? Do I need to go have a sit in my comfy chair? Do I need a cup of tea? Do I need to call a friend? Do I need to reach out and, and ask someone else what they might need to be okay. of service to someone else? But taking that pause mm -hmm. and just assessing what is it that I need right now is all the benefits of this mindfulness practice. So in my world, we would call that a positive coping mechanism. Without a doubt. It's a big word, big phrase, I guess, but it's yes. talking about how to use useful, healthy things in your life to deal with those feelings that, and I think the first step is that reflection, like you say, Pause. with... You've got to be able to reflect on what's going on before you can figure out what do I do about it and why do I have these behaviors like that. And then tell me, um, does yoga play a part in this because you, you're a yogi also? Is that correct? I do. I teach. Uh, one of the things that that pause does for us mm -hmm. is it gives us a moment just a moment, if it's just nothing but a breath, to respond rather than to react. That's big. I like that. Respond rather than react. So reacting, so we're this piece of wood floating down the river, 
and the reaction is the piece of wood goes to one side and then goes to the other side. And if there's rapids, you know, I'm thinking of the Potomac, you know, just like bam, 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 mm -hmm. right? And so it's like whiplash. And if I'm just reacting to life's curveballs, I'm mm -hmm. going to get them every day, every single day. Right. There's never going to be a day where it's just, if it is, that's a miracle, where it's just chill. When I'm simply reacting, there's no pause. There's no thought, and there's a lot of victimization. Mm. The world is out to beat me up, and I am completely powerless over anything over the course of my day. I'm just putting out fires all day long, right? When we take that pause, just a breath, blood pressure goes down, mm -hmm. heart rate goes down, I can make a better informed decision about how to react to that side of the river. And what I've done is I've gotten the power back. Mm -hmm. So many of us feel so powerless over so many things in our life. Mm -hmm. And we are. There's no doubt I'm powerless over the rain. I'm powerless over the sun. I'm powerless over the heat. But there are things that I have control over. And one of them is how I respond to the curveballs that get thrown to me. Mm -hmm. And if I can feel some of that power, I'm going to need those behaviors and those substances less. Mm -hmm. Because there's going to be less deprivation for me because I'm going to feel more in control of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't need to control you. Boy, do I love to try to do that. You're out of my control in a right. beautiful way, but I can certainly control how I respond to you. Right. right. And when I feel in control, it gets underneath those feelings and those behaviors so that I can make more calculated decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So yoga... Breathing and moving on the mat helps me to take that pause. And there's no, there's nobody in that, within those four corners of that mat but me. Right. The teacher's asking me to do something with my body. If my body doesn't feel like that works for me, then I'm going to do something else. That's taking my response back in control feeling my breath the whole time I'm moving. Mm -hmm. I think it's a deeply spiritual practice. I do. And it builds good core strength. Oh, that's what I teach. People are a little uh, surprised when you talk about yoga because they think that, oh, you know, it's easy. It's a bunch of people maybe meditating and ringing a bowl or something like that. But really, it really builds endurance and strength in addition to that sort of breathing and meditating and coming within your own body. To me, it's so both in mm -hmm. and it's, it's so not going to the gym. It's hard. <laughs> I teach a hard class. Well, you, you look like you're <laughs> and this is all yoga. I've never done anything else but yoga in my wow. life. Wow. Uh, I teach a lot of core classes and it does is it, 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 um, it strengthens this whole physiological air area in our body, but metaphysically and spiritually, our core is who we are. Mm -hmm. It's our heart. It's, it's, it's literally um, the essence of who we are. Mm -hmm. So when we do core, we get so clear right. about who we are. There's, a, there, there's an honesty there that comes out of class. I see people come into class and I see them leave and I see them continue to come back there's something that happens outside of the teacher that happens in here that is so radically different than going to the gym. And I got jocks coming into my class sweating bullets. I mean, this is, these are hard classes, mm -hmm. but there's something that happens in the mind and in the heart that's very different than just going to the gym. Mm -hmm. Well, and I've heard people say it's your own practice. Yes. So that's part of it. Yes. So... As far as um, cancer patients specifically, how would you say your program helps them specifically? 
my feeling is is that all of us have a sense of dis-ease, mm. whether it's in the mind or the body in the spirit. And I am so about empowering people to live a whole life no matter what is happening. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the word victimization before. For me, I want to live a free life, mm -hmm. free of my own judgments of myself. But I also, or and I also want to live a life that is free to be the most whole me that I can mm -hmm. be in the midst of the struggle in the midst of dis-ease. And for me, it is so empowering to do just a few things that I know from experience can heal the body-mind. Mm -hmm. And I know that clean, whole food, mindful exercise, and some kind of meditation prayer practice heals the spirit. I know this to be true. So for me, I wouldn't want to go a day without it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. It is, for me, it's like my vitamins. Well, you, you mentioned some very powerful words like healing and addressing the disease and looking at living basically the best way that you can. Is yeah. that right? It is. And one of the to me, one of the endemic cultural, maybe it's across the human condition, aspects of our life that I think causes us suffering is our sense of separation and disconnection from mm -hmm. each other, from ourselves, and from some power greater than ourselves. Call it whatever you want to call it. I believe that doing these practices getting in touch with the earth that created us, the earth that grew flowers and plants and berries and nuts, consuming that and coming back to ourselves with the breath, spending that moment, those few moments, stilling the mind, stilling the body and connecting with the breath, that, that divine breath, the miracle, what, what, when, when we're willing to do that, what we find is that we're all connected. Mm. We're all connected because we're breathing the same breath. And that deep underneath our skin, I don't care where you go in the globe, the feelings that we have are all the same. And so we feel less alone when we're willing to do these practices, when mm -hmm. I'm taking some of this power back and responding to life rather than just being whiplashed by it. Mm -hmm. And I feel, just for me, when I'm going through any kind of dis-ease, whether it's chemo, whether it's um, going for pre-op, whatever it is, there in the mind, we can create a story that no one's ever experienced this but me. You know, my own story is precious and futile and fatalistic and despairing and hopeless. And the minute we share our story, mm -hmm. the minute there's a connection mm -hmm. and we can walk arm in arm as opposed to this judgment thing that we have that you don't, you don't know me. If you did, you wouldn't love me anyway. And some of us need that that person to person connection, but ultimately I really believe that we need to feel connected to ourselves mm -hmm. and to a power greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. So some of the sort of words and phrases I picked up when I looked at your website was health and healing, freedom and wholeness, encouragement, transformation. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned a relationship between faith and the physical and mental well-being and a quieter union of our parts. And I love those phrases. So if, if someone was really interested in learning more, I know you have a website and the book. So the website is mindfullyfed.com. Okay. 
and that's how they could get in touch with you. Yes, there's a way to reach out to me through and the website. Is, and is the book available on Amazon? Yes, and okay. you can also purchase both books through my website. Oh, excellent. And then you get an autographed copy. Oh, nice, nice. And so you live here in the Wilmington area. I do. But I also heard you say something about traveling to New York to work with clients. You, I do. You do that too. I do. So a little bit of everything. Well, I thank do. you so, You're so, so much for being here. And I think it's a reminder to all of us to forgive ourselves and figure mm. out what we're feeling and do the best thing for our own bodies. There you go. So um, thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank okay. you. And then I wanted to let everyone know that our next speaker will be on August 22nd. We're going to switch gears a little bit. Leon McKay is a local um, acupuncturist here in the Wilmington area representing McKay Healing Arts. So he um, has training in traditional Chinese medicine. So he'll talk about acupuncture and Qigong for those of you who haven't heard of that before. So it should be interesting. And I welcome you all to join us on August 22nd. Thank you so much. <laughs>